Well, after this stunning start, sketches by Boz, um, came the novels, published as serials. I wanted to say about sketches by Boz that, in fact, through them, through the observations he made in them, Dickens built up a store of knowledge that would nourish the rest of his art all his life, and there is no doubt that it did, and you recognise it coming up. The novels, published as serials, changed the face of publishing and made him famous and beloved, read by all classes, the characters' names passing into the language at once. It was said that he amused the upper classes, but the lower classes felt that he was on their side, a useful trick to pull off. <laughs> for the first time, except I think perhaps for the Pilgrim's pro Progress, copies of novels were actually seen in the houses of the poor on the shelf because they could afford these very cheap paper serials. <laughs> And even the illiterate um, could learn Dickens stories because they were all instantly dramatised and played all over the country in, in the, in the theatres. Uh, so he was extremely well known. Uh, Lewis describes butcher's boys talking about the next episode of uh, Pickwick Papers in the street together. <coughs> well, at 25, Dickens' first child was born and he was writing Pickwick Papers and Oliver Twist simultaneously, a piece a month for, for each of them, from January to October through that year. Same time, moving his family in, from their first uh, lodgings into a solid townhouse in Bloomsbury, Doughty Street, where the museum is now. He was becoming a member of the Garrick Club. He was forming an intense friendship with his future biographer, Forster, with whom he walked and rode, talked and dined, and whom he made into his chief advisor and effectively his agent, who helped him to sort out the tangles Dickens was constantly getting into by promising things <coughs> to too many publishers and not being able to deliver. At this same time, he was noticed at a private dinner by John Stuart Mill, who said, he reminds me of Carlyle's picture of Camille Desmoulins and his face of dingy blackguardism irradiated with genius. <laughs> Such a phenomenon does not often appear in a lady's room. I think plain living and high thinking was not Dickens's thing, and John Stuart Mill realised it. <laughs> the dingy blackguard, irradiated with genius, dressed himself in flamboyant clothes, jewellery, described by Thackeray as being all geraniums and ringlets. <laughs> he was seen to comb his hair in public, but then it was beautiful hair, chestnut brown, glossy, curly and thick. He was a giver of celebratory parties, a player of charades, a giver of conjuring tricks for children, a dancer of quadrilles and Roger de Coverley into the small hours. He could have any box he wanted in any London theatre and he saw everything there was to see. He smoked cigars, he kept brandy, gin, port, sherry, champagne, claret, sauterne on hand. He suffered from terrible colds, I have great sympathy with him, but through the letters come these terrible colds. Bizzery, bizzery, I have been crying all day. My nose is an inch shorter than it was last Tuesday from constant friction. <laughs> he began every day with a cold shower. He would work at night or he would get up early or sometimes he would come down and write in the room where his family was. He was taking French lessons. This was the start of his great love for France and for Paris and for the people and their ways that made him tell his son Henry when he was old that his sympathies were so much with the French that he ought to have been a Frenchman. You don't often hear this about Dickens, but it means a lot to me, being partly French, and it re was very important in his life. He was an obsessive, Dickens, always. He was an obsessive organiser of his surroundings. When he went to a hotel, he rearranged the furniture. Of course, I arranged both the room and my luggage before going to bed, he wrote to his wife, and then to another friend from rooms in Broadstairs. The furniture in all the rooms has been entirely rearranged by the same extraordinary character. He means himself. <laughs> he called himself the inimitable. It had been a joke. Boz, his pen name, uh, and his old schoolmaster had sent him a snuff box, and he loved calling himself the inimitable. And he didn't. He wasn't entirely joking because he could see that there was no other writer whose work could surpass his, and that no one among his friends or family began to match his energy and enthusiasm, his energy and ambition. I mean to say, what else? Well, with Dickens, you shake the kaleidoscope and another surprise appears. I've said he was an obsessive. 
Walking was one of his obsessions, 12, 15, 20 miles a day. He needed to walk in order to write. He once almost had a nervous breakdown in Switzerland because there were not the streets he needed to walk in as he wrote. He had a large circle of friends, artists, journalists, actors, poets, a few, a few lawyers and politicians, a few society people, some of them not quite respectable, like Count Dorsey, the Frenchman, and Lady Blessington, his mistress, or his friend. <laughs> and the ultra respect and others like the ultra respectable Miss Coots, who was the richest woman in the country, would invite Dickens to meet to members of the royal family at her place in Highgate. And Dickens um, was deeply loved by his friends and very dependent on them. When he left London, ostensibly to get some work done quietly because there was too much going on in London, within a day he would be sending off letters to his friends, imploring them to come down and join him <laughs> at his hideaway, wherever he was. Um, he, he couldn't really sort of function without things happening all the time. He was always organising dinners, lunches, jaunts, and his letters are full of wonderful accounts of galloping across Salisbury Plain or going to Cornwall, which went everybody laughing. Men, of course, only men, uh, these, all these wonderful jaunts. Lionel Trilling said something wonderful about Dickens. The mere record of his conviviality is exhausting. <laughs> He filled every moment of his life. Well, I found trying to write about Dickens was rather like trying to write five biographies in one. The novelist, the journalist, and editor of weekly magazines for 20 years, the performer in theatricals and reader of his own work, the philanthropist, the organiser of a family of nine children with whom he sometimes travelled abroad in capacious coaches, taking maids, and the dog, I think when they went to Italy, he m mentions in the letter, unfortunately, the dog's bowels gave trouble the whole way to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> I decided the word meanwhile must be the most useful word in any narrative of Dickens' life. <laughs> meanwhile, he had promised another publisher. Meanwhile, he had quarrelled with his publishers. Meanwhile, an idea for a new novel was growing in his head. Meanwhile, in October, he had just started writing his next Christmas book, Meanwhile, he was organising theatricals to raise money for the orphaned children of his friend. Meanwhile, Catherine was pregnant again. When the third child was born, Dickens said, this is the last, but somehow it wasn't so. <laughs> and it's one of the surprising things about Dickens, who was quite good at technical matters, that he didn't find a way of stopping that. Meanwhile, he was planning to take the family to Italy. Meanwhile, he was also planning to set up a home for homeless girls with Miss Coots's help and money, and organising every detail, architectural, educational, dietary, sartorial and moral, interviewing the matrons. I mean, that home uh, for homeless women uh, was the most extraordinary, one of the most extraordinary uh, works in his life, uh, done out of pure goodness. He started early on this course of wanting to help people and to change the world for the better. <coughs> he was proud of his goodness and it was an essential part of his image of himself. Inimitable, inimitable not only as a writer but as a man active in trying to do practical good. Among the many charitable enterprises he was involved in were raising money, I've said, for widows and orphans of friends, and he would keep in touch with the children, sometimes for years, and make sure that things were all right for them and they adored him. Not his own children, these other orphan children. Uh, he advised Miss Coots on a great many things, including the building of decent housing in the poor East End of London. He took up the cause of sanitation in London. He had a brother, his sister, Letitia, married uh, uh, Henry Austin, a man who worked very hard for the health board. And he did a wonderful thing, encouraging and raising money for mechanics institutes and literary societies to educate working men and women in the industrial towns, in the Midlands and the north of England, <coughs> Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, and so on, he would go out and speak and raise money. These, these mechanic institutes were often the precursors of the universities that came later, and he was worshipped, understandably worshipped, by the working populations of those towns, and he's, he cared about the education of the working girls as well as the men. He worked very hard to organise a self-help scheme for authors. He despised the Royal Literary Fund, which I sat for many years, as being condescending, and he thought authors should be organised to help themselves, but authors proved resistant. <laughs> it didn't work out. I've mentioned the Home for Homeless Women. Um, it was really to help girls out of prostitution or to stop them from becoming 
uh, prostitutes. And he, he, his aim was to give them, make them happy. That one girl, when he was showing her the room she was going to be in with three beds, I think she was to share with another girl, when she saw a bed and was told it was for her, she started crying because she had never slept on a bed in her life. And the stories, a wonderful book by Jenny Hartley about the Home for Homeless Women, the stories are amazing. Um, he raised money for children's hospitals. He raised money for children's hospitals in the East End. He went to visit them. He wrote about them in his magazine. He raised money for Great Ormond Street. Um, mm -hmm. This all would be an extraordinary record um, for someone without Dickens' other commitments. His daughter Kate said about him years after his death, he was too mixed to be a gentleman, but he was wonderful. I think that's a really marvellous thing to have your daughter say about you. <laughs> too mixed to be a gentleman, but he was wonderful. I mean, she was very angry with him about a lot of things in life, but she also adored him. Tolstoy called him the greatest novelist of the 19th century. And how did he write his novels? On little slips of paper with a quill pen, delivering his copy to his printers, always in a hurry to see them printed monthly or weekly instalments straight to the public with no time for second thought. They came out of two things. First, his extraordinary powers of observation, panoramic and minute, already shown in sketches by Boz, then out of his obsessiveness. He told his wife in a letter of 1853 that the intense pursuit of any idea that takes complete possession of me is one of the qualities that makes me different sometimes for good, sometimes I dare say for evil, from other men. And of the many obsessions that stud his life, and there are many, um, the most important were certainly the creative obsessions. When an idea for a story or a character took hold of him so forcibly that he would walk the streets all night with it, turn himself into a character in his study, speak with the voice of that character, his daughter Mamie would hear him doing that, and other people too, grimacing as he did so. Dickens famously sort of became his characters. The actor in him uh, embodied the creatures of his imagination. And I've nearly finished. And I'm just going to give you, because he is a writer, two examples of his writing, which I think are particularly wonderful. From David Copperfield, where some of his descriptions are so finely accurate that he seems to be watching a scene as it takes place before his eyes. One is where Peggotty is telling little David about his mother's last days and death, talking gently about how delicate she was, sinking every day, more timid, more frightened-like. But she never changed to her foolish Peggotty, didn't my sweet girl? Dickens writes, Here Peggotty stopped and softly beat upon my hand a little while. And later again, another silence followed, another gentle beating on my hand. This is wonderfully observed. Um, about someone who finds it hard to express herself and needs to search for the right words, that unconscious beating with your hand or your finger as you think, it's a sort of extraordinary thing for Dickens to have picked up and to describe to us. And then another little instance from, uh, from the childhood of, of David Copperfield is of course one of the, the great pieces of writing about childhood, like Charlotte Bronte, Jane, like Tolstoy's account of his childhood. Um, when David is worn out from his walk from London to Dover and faces his formidable Aunt Betsy as she stands in the front garden, armed with her gardening knife, he goes in, goes up to her, and he simply puts out one finger and touches her. Now, anyone who's lived with a child will recognise that gesture. And Doctor Dickens had observed his younger brothers and sisters and his own children when feeling timid, doing just that. And here he plucks it from his memory and makes perfect use of it. You could never forget Daniel you know, David just touching, not knowing what is going to happen, what this for forceful, fierce woman is going to do with him, mm -hmm. whether he's safe or whether he's not safe. So he touches her.